Okay, uh, I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Kristen Kuchelman. I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Partnerships with the PKD Foundation. And today I'm your hospitality host. You have joined us for a great session on managing nutrition as dietary needs change from pre-dialysis to post-transplant. Before we get started, we will have time for questions and answers at the end. We are using the chat feature for that, so you can type those in the questions and I'll read them on your behalf. You're welcome to keep your camera on, but do keep yourself uh, muted as the presentation goes on. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this session, Melanie Betts. She's got a lot of fabulous letters after her name. I'm <laughs> very impressed. Melanie is a registered dietitian at the University of Chicago in the section of nephrology and is certified in renal and geriatric nutrition. She provides outpatient nutrition education and counseling to patients with chronic kidney disease, including polycystic kidney disease. Her research interests include patient knowledge and adherence to renal diets, plant-based diets, in kidney disease and the ro role of nutrition in kidney stone prevention. Melanie, it's my pleasure to turn the presentation over to you. Awesome, thank you, Kristen, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here today and quote, meet all of you. Um, and it's so cool to see that we have people from all over the, the country and even the world. So um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I have a lot to get through, so I'm going to try to get through everything. We have such a short amount of time together, but we'll um, definitely leave some time for questions. So if I breeze over something, please feel free to ask questions at the end. Um, all right, so the disclaimer and disclosure, here's my bio. Okay, so um, the topic, as the, the title suggests, we're, I'm really going to focus today on how um, nutrition needs change, and they do change quite a bit from kind of early CKD or kind of early um, maybe diagnosis of PKD when your kidney function is basically normal and then um, how, how nutrition changes if your kidney function does decline um, and then how it changes on dialysis and then even again post-transplant. So um, there's lots and lots of things to consider. So we'll kind of walk through all the, the high points, right? Like sodium, protein, potassium, et cetera. So here's kind of my overview slide. And I think that you guys do have my slide. I know this is kind of, a, um, there's a lot to read on here. So hopefully you can look at this in more detail later if, you, um, if you'd like to. Um, but this is kind of an overview. And like I said, all of these specific nutrients sort of change over time and we're gonna walk through each of them individually. So of course, we're gonna start with sodium, everyone's favorite topic. Um, and salt is pretty consistent all the way through, early CKD, advanced CKD without dialysis, when you're on dialysis and post-transplant, -trans we always wanna keep sodium in a low-ish range. Um, and so the recommendation across the board is about 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. Um, so why do we care about salt so much? Um, for, for PKD specifically, um, a high sodium diet is directly linked to cyst growth. So that's definitely motivation to help keep the salt out of our diets. Um, and then it also, of course, helps keep our blood pressure under control, which gets more difficult to do if PKD or CKD progresses. Um, and so trying to keep salt down can help, help keep that blood pressure control and help protect the kidneys even more. Um, and then just in general, um, general cardiovascular or heart health. Um, so again, the goal is about 2,300 milligrams. Um, and then if there are any children that you are caring for on, on, on the presentation, I wouldn't wanted to include those goals as well. Um, and I always love to, to show this because I think it's you know, just kind of eye-opening. Eye um, do we, so, you know, when we're kind of thinking about, is this a healthy menu or is someone, you know, you're trying to make healthy choices. I feel like this is a very reasonable uh, menu or food that someone might eat throughout the day. So um, like for breakfast, they're choosing turkey bacon, which is healthier for you, right? Um, they've got a, a healthy turkey sandwich, some veggie soup, they're choosing baked potato chips. Um, you know, and then some chicken with some veggies for, uh, for dinner, even a side salad. So, um, you know, this seems like a pretty, a pretty healthy meal, 
But when you look into how much salt is in all that stuff, we're at over 4,000 milligrams of sodium, which may sound like quite a bit, um, but this is pretty average for the, United, for the United States. The average sodium consumption in the United States is somewhere around 35-ish um, milligrams, um, 3,500 milligrams of sodium per day. And so this is certainly not un, unreasonable. Um, and so if we look at maybe making some small tweaks to, to this menu, um, we can get the sodium down actually even lower than we need to go. So um, here we're swapping that bacon, turkey bacon, fun fact, is usually even higher in sodium than regular pork bacon because it's lower in fat, so you have to make it taste good. So usually they add more sodium. Um, maybe we can, instead of using deli meat, that's a huge culprit of sodium, I find, for a lot of people, um, maybe just using some baked turkey, um, swapping that soup for maybe some carrot and celery sticks, the potato chips for an apple. You get the idea, right? Um, and so if we really kind of nitpick and, and make lower sodium choices or even just kind of tweak how some of those foods are made, I got the sodium all the way down to 851, which even is even less than what we have to do. But you get the idea, right? Some of these small changes can really make a big difference in terms of your total amount of salt that you're eating throughout the day. Um, whenever I talk about sodium, um, I always like to, to um, mention this fact. So about 80% of the salt that we eat is already in our food. Um, and so to really work on getting the sodium out of what we're eating, we really want to focus on choosing foods that are low sodium in the first place. The salt shaker is actually not, for most people, adding that much salt. And in fact, if you are um, making most of your food at home and using non-processed ingredients, there is definitely room um, to add a little bit of salt to your food. Um, it, again, if you are not choosing those foods that are so high in sodium. Um, and so here are just kind of some, some of those common, culprit, common culprits. I mentioned the lunch meat, cured meats, bacon, sausage, smoked meat, salami, right? You know that one. Um, condiments can add up if we use large amounts of them, cheeses, soup. Um, bread is a surprising source of sodium that I think sometimes we don't think about. So I, I listed quick breads on here, which are um, breads that don't have yeast in them, and those tend to be even higher in sodium. Um, so things like biscuits, cornbread, banana bread, et cetera, but even like normal bread, if you will, or like, you know, just like a whole wheat or white bread that you might get from the grocery store, um, that can have a surprising amount of sodium. So you definitely want to check the food label on those. Um, of course, canned or pickled vegetables, frozen prepared food. So you get the idea, right? These are the foods where the salt is coming in and those are the foods that we really wanna pay attention to um, the food labels on to make sure that we're not going over our sodium amount. Um, so here I have just some recommended um, food alternatives for, for these high sodium options. So um, my favorite one that I always like to say um, is if instead of salt using fresh or dried um, herbs and spices, vinegar and lemon and lime juice is my very favorite trick. So, um, you know, and you can get fancy with all the different vinegars. So there's like balsamic, um, there's uh, an adorable little like fancy boutique vinegar store in Saugatuck, Michigan that I love to go to. And they have this blueberry vinegar that is amazing. Um, that's really great just by itself, but you, you get the idea, right? There's so many different things in, in, in vinegar, different vinegars that you can use that add so much delicious flavor. Um, so yeah, so again, you guys have these slides. I don't wanna waste time going through all of this information, but you can look, look through my swaps later. Um, another big culprit of sodium is food that is not cooked at home. So whether it's cooked at a restaurant or something you might pick up at a gas station or the grocery store or those types of things, um, that, that food tends to have a whole lot more salt than if you cooked it at home. And so that's not to say you can never go to a restaurant again. Obviously, that's not reasonable and no one wants to live like that. Um, but when you go to restaurants, you can try to make the best choices that you can. Um, and here are just kind of some general tips for help making lower sodium choices when you're at a restaurant. So um, avoiding sauces, dressings, or fried food, specifically fried, fried foods that have that breading on them, um, asking for the sauce or dressing on the side, and then you kind of have control over how much goes on there. Um, you can just ask that something be prepared simply, most, depending on the type of restaurant that you go to, right, um, most restaurants are pretty accommodating these days. Um, salad can be a great option, a great way to get in more vegetables, but you want to watch out for cheese croutons and dressing. Those tend to be the three things that really throw the sodium um, 
you know, through the roof. Um, of course, we're just watching portion size. So even if you have something really salty, if you eat a reasonable portion, then that, you know, can likely fit within your 2300 milligrams um, and always asking for nutrition information. So um, basically any chain restaurant is going to have nutrition information, whether it's online or you could ask for it on like a brochure or handout when you're at the restaurant. And that's, of course, the gold standard for trying to figure out how much salt is in the food that you're eating. All right, so moving on to protein, and this is one of the really big ones that changes across the spectrum that we talk about. So um, early CKD, um, we really, it's sort of just a moderate amount of protein that we should be eating. We, we think in the nutrition world, we think about protein in terms of how many grams of protein per kilogram body weight that you should eat. Um, and these are just like recommendations. Your, your protein amount really has to be individualized to you based on some other factors um, that are going on in your, um, in your medical history. So this really should be specific to you based on what your dietitian says, but here's kind of like the general recommendations. Um, like I said, early CKD, we've got sort of a moderate amount of protein. And then if um, GFR does go down and we progress to advanced CKD, then we actually want to go um, much lower in protein. So here I put 0.6 to 0.8, but you can go even lower, um, going lower to like 0.4 even grams per kilogram with something called keto analogs. Um, and then if um, someone starts dialysis, then protein needs totally flip and we actually need high protein diets um, on dialysis. So that's, that's one of, like I said, one of these ones that changes quite a bit, um, literally black and white um, for, for protein. And then if someone gets a, a transplant, then we actually kind of go back to early CKD. We don't want a high protein diet necessarily because we want to do everything we can to protect that new shiny kidney. Um, but we, you know, we don't need to be super, super low. So we go back to sort of that moderate amount. All right. So where does protein come from? most of us know, right? The majority of protein that we eat comes from, from meat, right? So when I say meat, I usually mean any sort of animal flesh, which sound, sounds weird, but when I say meat, sometimes people think only beef. Um, but really uh, uh, beef or meat or poultry, chicken, pork, fish, all those things actually have about the same amount of protein per ounce in them. Um, of course, red meat is gonna be more um, problematic because of sort of the um, fatty acid profile and the heart health aspects, but in general, all those things have about the same amount of protein. Um, of course, we can also get protein from plant sources, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple slides, but um, there's going to be protein in plants like um, nuts, lentils, beans, um, of course, eggs, also dairy, tofu, um, so lot, lots of different foods can give us protein. Um, and people always ask like, okay, Melanie, so like that 0.8 grams per kilogram, like what, what does that actually look like? So here's just kind of like a general idea. Um, and remember, this is a weight-based recommendation. So it's going to uh, vary drastically based on what um, body size you have. Um, but if you were 175 pounds, male or female, actually, it's, it's the same, um, that's going to equate to about 64 grams of protein per day. Um, Yes, so, so keep, keep that in mind, that 64 grams. Um, so how much protein is actually in these foods that have protein in them? Um, so you can see that by far that animal flesh, whether that's the, the chicken, beef, pork, or fish, has the most protein. So 25 grams or so in three ounces, which is super small. Like that's the size of a deck of cards, which you always hear people um, say uh, protein portion sizes should be. So when we're thinking about that 65-ish grams of protein per day, that's a big chunk of it in just that tiny piece of, of meat. Um, and there's going to be little bits of protein in pretty much everything that we eat, except fruit. Fruit tends to be pretty low, but um, there's going to be little bits of protein in everything. So it does add up quite a bit, um, you know, across all the foods that you're eating. So like one egg is going to have seven grams, even a slice of bread is going to have like four, um, even rice or other grains like the bread is going to have a little bit. Um, again, even vegetables, like two grams in that um, half cup of cooked broccoli. Um, so you, you get the idea. There's little bits of protein in everything. And so it does add up pretty quick. Um, and then I really like, like to point this out. So 
Um, we live in a very pro-protein culture, right? Like every everywhere you turn, it's like, oh, this is protein packed and oh, this is so good for you. You should be having protein powders. Um, but the vast majority of the people in the United States, at least, are getting much more protein than they need. Um, and fun fact, that, that 0.8 grams of protein is actually what everyone needs. So that's not really like lower than what is recommended. That 0.8 is what's recommended for everyone, you know, like it's the general healthy person recommendation. Um, so yeah, we, we're basically, we're all getting a whole lot more protein than we need. So I put this, this line here, it's, you know, that the recommendation is going to be different based for everyone, but I, I put it at about 60 grams and based on sort of the average human weight. Um, so you can see that we're much, much above what we really need. Um, so for most of us, we're eating about a third more protein than we need. All right, um, I promised I would talk about the difference between animal and plant proteins because this is a pretty hot topic. Um, and so plant proteins in general are a whole lot better for your kidneys compared to animal proteins. Um, and that is for lots of different reasons. Um, but one of them is that they actually are just a whole lot lower in protein. So if you're eating more meals that are um, where the protein sources from plants, it's just gonna be a whole lot easier to stay um, uh, at your recommended amount of protein that you should be eating. Um, in addition to that, um, plant proteins are associated with a whole lot better heart health, which is uh, a really big deal for people who have PKD, because we know that that is um, people who have PKD are at higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, there's all of the wonderful benefits of fiber. It's going to help keep you regular. Um, it's going to, uh, fiber helps prevent cancer and all sorts of other chronic diseases. Um, they really do um, give you plenty of protein for kidney disease. Like I was talking about before, most of us are getting way more protein that we need. Um, you don't need to be worried about not getting enough protein if you switch to a, a more plant-based diet. Um, and then another big thing that uh, benefit of plant proteins is that they produce a lot less acid, which is sort of a weird concept. Um, but the reason that protein in general is um, so, one of the reasons that protein is so harmful to kidneys is that it produces acid during its metabolism. So um, the more protein we eat, the more acid is produced that our kidneys have to deal with, and they don't like that very much. And so a higher diet acid load is associated with a faster progression of kidney disease. Um, but plant proteins are much, much, much less acidic compared to animal proteins. Um, and in fact, some of them even are kind of the opposite, a little bit basic, or generally they're, they're neutral. And so the more plant proteins you or the more you switch from animal to plant proteins, the, the lower you can get this dietary acid load. So here are some examples um, of healthy plant proteins that you might want to think about incorporating. Again, um, uh, healthy eating for kidneys is different for everyone, but in general, these are some healthy plant proteins that you might want to try. Um, so we have tofu, nuts and nut, but nut butters, beans, lentils, seeds, whole grains, um, seitan and peas. So lots of different options for you. All right, so I have, I'm, I'm not saying that every single person with PKD needs to go on a vegetarian diet. I realize that's not realistic and some people don't wanna do that and that's totally cool. Um, but here are some tips um, if you do choose to, to eat meat or animal protein um, to keep that total amount of protein in check. Um, of course, we want to limit our portion sizes of meat um, to about three ounces, but that's definitely going to vary for people based on your body size and some other factors. Um, some people really like to think about limiting that meat or animal protein to once a day. Um, so, you know, a lot of times they're like, oh, I'm totally cool not having meat uh, at breakfast and lunch, but I'm, for dinner, I want to have my, my fish or whatever. And like, that's cool. Um, that can be a good way to help keep it down. Um, of course, choosing um, more vegetarian sources of protein. Um, another big one is thinking about um, making sure or thinking about only choosing one protein source per meal. So I feel like this comes up a lot with beans. Like beans are wonderful for your kidneys, um, but if you're having like pork and beans, then that's sort of just adding a whole bunch of extra protein um, that you don't need. So instead trying to choose maybe the pork or the beans, um, or maybe you have like a salad that has nuts and chicken on it. So maybe choosing just one or the other to help keep the protein in check. 
Um, of course, definitely avoiding um, protein powder shakes, nutrition drinks, you know, all those types of things. Because for most people, those are just adding unnecessary protein to your day. Again, most of us are getting more than we need. Um, think about um, trying to plan your meals around either a healthy carbohydrate or vegetables instead of the protein. So, um, you know, a lot of times we think, oh, what am I having for dinner? I'm having chicken for dinner. But like, try to switch that and try to think about, oh, no, I'm having X, Y, Z for dinner instead of that. Um, and another thing is um, making sure that snacks aren't adding a whole lot of extra protein to your day. So I really think fruit is like the perfect snack because it's portable, it's easy, it's a great source of, um, of that, uh, of the anti-acid, it's a great source of alkali. Um, but anyway, so just making sure that you are um, choosing healthy snacks as well. All right. Um, so the next uh, nutrients that I wanted to talk about what is phosphorus. Um, and this one is a bit more tricky. Um, and it, it does change throughout this spectrum. Um, so, and phosphorus is also going to be super individualized based on your lab values. Um, so bear with me. I'm, uh, this is kind of like a big picture overview of how phosphorus changes. Um, so early CKD, we want to limit phosphorus additives. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that in a little bit. Um, so we, we want to do that in early CKD. And then if GFR goes down and, and we, we fall into advanced CKD, you still want to avoid those additives. And you might want to start thinking about um, phosphorus from dairy and meat and some other animal sources. Um, and then if dialysis happens, then it becomes super individualized, but likely you definitely want to continue avoiding um, phosphorus from, from those additives and, and dairy. Meat may get a little bit tricky because, um, because people on dialysis need, need more protein, but again, that's super, super individualized. Um, and then post-transplant, we kind of just go back to the same thing as early CKD. Um, sort of natural phosphorus I wouldn't be so worried about, but um, phosphorus additives we still want to avoid just, again, to help keep, keep that kidney as healthy as possible. So why do we care about phosphorus? Um, the biggest thing is that high phosphorus levels are associated with a faster progression of CKD. So that's that's pretty big. Um, and, and high phosphorus levels can also have negative impacts on both our bone and bones and heart. Um, so again, those artificial sources should be limited for everyone. And I'll talk again a little bit about why that is in just a second. Um, but natural sources of phosphorus, so phosphorus that occurs naturally, specifically in plant foods, are usually totally fine. Um, they may need to be restricted for some people with very advanced CKD or people on dialysis, but for most people, um, natural sources of phosphorus are, are totally cool. And the reason for that is this. So um, the, the amount of phosphorus that our bodies absorb from these different sources is dramatically different. Um, so you can see um, down on the left here that phosphorus from plant foods, so from beans, lentils, nuts, seeds, whole grains, um, foods that maybe some of you were told to avoid because you have kidney disease, um, the phosphorus isn't absorbed. And in fact, the um, updated guidelines that came out from the National Kidney Foundation and the Academy of Nutrition and dietetics just last August, so about, about a year ago, um, is kind of reflective of this um, difference in, in bioavailability or the amount of phosphorus that is absorbed from our foods. Um, so again, we, we care very little about the phosphorus in plant foods because our body doesn't use it anyway. We just excrete it. Um, and then dairy and meat, um, the absorption does go up quite a bit. Um, we absorb about 80% from dairy and 80, 80, 90-ish percent from, from that animal flesh. Um, again, meat, poultry, fish, and seafood. Um, and then phosphorus food additives, we care about a whole lot because our bodies suck up that phosphorus. Um, and we, um, there also tends to be quite a bit in there. So um, where do we find these, these phosphorus food additives? Um, and they are rampant. <laughs> they're, they're in they could potentially be in practically any, I'll use the word processed food um, that you can think of. Um, here are some of maybe the more common ones. Um, you find them very commonly in frozen prepared foods. So like, like TV dinners or like those bags of like pre-made uh, seasoned stir fries things, you know what I'm talking about? Um, or like convenience meals, like certainly a box of macaroni and cheese or like a can of stew or something like that. 
um, salty snacks. So you might find them in certain brands of even like pretzels or cereals. Um, cola is what's most famous for having phosphorus and it has phosphoric acid on um, both regular and diet. Coke and cola, um, whether it's Coke or Pepsi or, or off brands have that phosphoric acid. Um, but you'll also find phosphorus in, in other things. Um, like it's in some flavors of crystal light, for example, but not in other flavors. So um, you really, really kind of have to check to see what products you're buying to see if they have phosphorus in them. Um, another really big one is non-dairy creamers. So like the, those um, delicious cr uh, coffee creamers that we all, all use so, so commonly, um, those tend to have phosphorus additives in them. And also, unfortunately, a lot of the milk or plant-based substitutes like almond milk or those uh, coconut milk or those types of things tend to have phosphorus additives in them as well. Um, and also fast food. So this is a, this is a big one. Um, any any fast food, um, you can be pretty much pretty positive that, that there's phosphorus additives in that. Um, so how do you know if your food has phosphorus additives in it? Um, and what you need to do is um, the only way that you can know, because unfortunately phosphorus is not explicitly listed on the nutrition facts label like sodium or calories or those types of things is or are. Um, so instead you have to hunt for it. So um, you have to look at the ingredients on that food label. And I apologize that this is so small, <laughs> um, but you have to look for ingredients um, that have the letters P-H-O-S, so FOS. And there's like literally hundreds of different words that FOS could be in. This, this one is disodium phosphate, if you can read that um, in, in these Cheetos here. Um, like I said, if you have, have a bottle of Coke, go, go look at it and you'll see that Coke has phosphoric acid. So there's lots of different words that that FOS could be hiding in, but, but the key is you want to stay away from FOS in any ingredient, um, because that means that ingredient is likely adding that artificial phosphorus to the food, which we want to avoid for basically everyone. All right, um, and then lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about potassium. So this one again is tricky because it's so individualized based on your lab values. Um, but I will say in general, phos a high phos or excuse me, a high potassium diet is good for people with PKD unless your blood levels of potassium get high. Um, and generally, blood levels of potassium don't get high until um, GFR is less than, say, 20 or so. That's when it start, we start to see it more often. Um, certainly, people on dialysis, it tends to be more of an issue. Um, and then maybe, maybe people um, with higher GFRs who are taking certain medications, you, you start to see it. But, but in general, most people, um, assuming you have a GFR greater than 20 um, or have a transplant, a high potassium diet is good um, because a high potassium diet is, is a, I mean, it's good for lots of things, but most importantly, perhaps, is it um, is beneficial for blood pressure control, which again helps protect your kidneys. Um, so potassium is really very, very specific um, to you based on your lab values. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to go through, I know um, if you've ever been told to go on a low potassium diet, you probably have been given a very large list of all these different fruits and vegetables that are quote good and quote bad to eat. Um, so I, I'm not, not going to go there, but I did want to point out um, that there is potassium in a whole lot more than fruits and vegetables um, and sort of like the phosphorus thing. Um, likely the potassium in these types of foods is absorbed a whole lot more and can impact our potassium levels a whole lot more than the potassium in a banana or tomato. Not saying if you need to limit potassium, go eat all the bananas. Um, but I do think it's important to kind of be aware that there is added potassium sort of lurking in lots of these processed foods um, that we might not even be realizing. So um, the, and, and any sort of meat and specifically processed meats like lunch meat um, tend to have these added, added potassium additives. Um, a lot of sugar-free drinks and, and actually a lot of low sodium products, unfortunately, have a lot of potassium in them because they tend to add a salty flavor with something called potassium chloride, which has a astonishing amount of potassium in it. 
Um, so yeah, so you'll see it in, in low sodium or low sugar or sugar-free products like Crystal Light um, and a lot of just other, I'll call them ultra processed foods. So um, things like chips and like, I don't know, like any, any of those types of things um, tend, tend to have a lot of potassium in them. So even more reason to try to stay away from some of these things. Um, I also like to point out, so um, on the right here, we have all of the sort of um, quote, high potassium fruits and vegetables that oftentimes people are told not to eat. Um, so banana, tomato, oranges, baked potato is super high. <laughs> Potatoes are very high in potassium. Um, but spinach, nuts, beans, right? All these things tend to show up on high potassium food lists. But if we look at how much potassium is in meats and other animal proteins, there's quite a bit of potassium in there too. So a lot of times, um, if people um, work on trying to keep the meat portions smaller or even swap in some of those plant proteins, that can actually end up helping your potassium too. And then lastly, I, uh, there's also lots of other things that can impact your blood potassium levels besides how much potassium you eat. Um, if your blood sugar is high, if you have too much acid on board, if you're constipated, if you're not moving your body, um, certain medications, um, all of these things can impact um, potassium levels. And so potassium management is really rather um, difficult and multifaceted. So definitely work with your dietitian to figure out what, what might make sense for you. Okay, I keep checking the time. I know that we're running out. Um, okay, so um, almost last, I wanna talk about fluid um, because this is a big topic of course for PKD and CKD in general. Um, so fluid, early CKD, or PKD, we want to drink a lot of water. Um, you may have been told that by, by your doctors. Um, we generally want to drink at least three, three or four liters of water per day because that's actually associated with slower cyst growth, sort of like the sodium as well. Um, if, uh, if GFR decreases to the point where we dialysis, likely we actually need to restrict fluid. So this is another one that totally switches. Um, but then if we get a transplant, then it actually kind of goes up and, um, you, I mean, you don't need to do um, like as much water as um, early PKD, um, but you want to make sure that you're hydrating your kidney well, sort of drinking a normal amount of water, I should say. Um, so again, our goal is three to four liters of fluid per day. Um, if you are exercising a ton or you live in a place where it's very hot and you sweat a lot, um, you want to make sure that you're replacing that fluid. Um, a good rule of thumb is actually a liter, additional liter of water per hour of exercise. So that's quite a bit of fluid. Um, so what should you be drinking? Obviously water is the most, most best thing for you. Um, I know it's not very exciting and we need to switch it up sometimes. So I'm um, doing sugar calorie free calorie free beverages can be um, a good addition to kind of mix it up. Um, maybe small amounts of juice. Um, the, oh, I, in the next slide I have better options. Um, so um, you could do crystal light or, or Mio drops. Again, if potassium is an issue, be careful with the potassium and some of those things. Um, my very favorite recommendation is LaCroix or other, uh, other um, like those unsweetened sparkling waters. I'm, I've am i become obsessed with them um, since I've been home <laughs> during the pandemic. I don't know about you guys, um, but yeah, but like LaCroix or bubbly or um, they're like they're, you know, all of them are basically the same. Um, Polar is another one I've recently become obsessed with, but whichever whichever brand you like, it doesn't really matter. Um, or you can try infusing your water. So adding like cucumbers, berries, grapefruit, uh, other herbs to fruit to your water can make it way more exciting um, and more more exciting to drink. Um, definitely, um, if you uh, if you some people don't like the taste of water or like, you know, they're like, oh, my water is gross. Um, sometimes a water filter can help with that. Um, in terms of some tips for trying to make sure you're drinking enough water, um, some people love to do uh, like a more formal thing. So you can get a water bottle with like markings on it. So this is just an example, but like by 8 a.m. I have to drink this much and 9 a.m. I have to drink this much. So that can be kind of fun to help keep you on track. Um, some people like to set alarms on their phone. Um, I hear that a lot. Um, or you can invest in one of these smart water bottles. So um, these water bottles are pretty cool. They like light up to remind you to drink. They track how much water you drink. Um, and they even sometimes will send like a reminder to your phone to remind you to drink. So if you want some high tech um, help, that can be a fun option too. 
All right. Um, and then I also had to mention food safety um, because this does become very, very important um, post transplant. Um, if you get a kidney transplant, you will need to be on those medications that suppress your immune system for the rest of your life. Um, and so that does make you more susceptible to foodborne illness. Um, and so just proper food safety that probably all of us should be doing anyway, just becomes especially important. Um, so these are just kind of like some general tips. So um, proper hand hygiene, making sure that you are washing, of course, all of your fruits and veggies, um, keeping raw meat and produce separate. So um, this, of course, like if you're preparing, like using a different cutting board for the two is, is certainly important. But another thing to keep in mind is um, like storing your meat, raw meat in your fridge underneath your produce. So then if that meat does drip, um, it's not going to drip on the apples that you're going to go eat, you know, uh, right away. Um, making sure that you refrigerate cold food right away, like right back, right when you get back from the grocery store or being especially mindful of like summer barbecues that might be coming up um, and being mindful of food that's been sitting out um, generally for more than four hours is kind of the, the point where we really want to be especially concerned about it. Um, and then generally avoiding um, rare or undercooked meats poultry fish and, shell and shellfish, um, unpasteurized cheese and dairy, um, and definitely any expired or I put iffy food products, right? Like sometimes we smell something, we're like, oh, that's fine. But if you are um, immunosuppressed, then probably should always err on the side of, you know, that's not fine. I should just throw it away. Um, and then of course, um, cooking your food to the proper temperatures. So here are the temperatures that we should be cooking our food to. Um, so generally 145 degrees, unless it's ground meat, and then we wanna get it to 160, just because that ground meat um, has a greater risk of being contaminated during the grinding process. Um, and poultry should be 165. All right, so um, what can I eat? <laughs> um, how, you know, you know, we've gone through all of these, um, micronutrients, but like what in the world am I supposed to eat? Um, and you may have seen this graphic before. This is from the USDA. This replaced the food, uh, food pyramid that most of us grew up with in school. Um, like, gosh, probably almost like 10 years ago now. Um, but I really like it because I think it's simple and I like that it's a plate and kind of helps us visualize like what in the world should we be eating? Um, so to simplify it, we want a little bit of protein. Your portion or amount is going to vary based on where you are in our spectrum, um, but generally we want a little bit of protein. So we want to be choosing unprocessed meats, poultry, fish, and seafood, or working on incorporating more of those vegetarian sources. Um, we want a little I'm bit of green. Let our speaker know we have about seven minutes remaining. Okay, perfect. Um, seven minutes. Um, so grains, we want a little bit with every meal, choosing primarily whole grains. Those are going to have more fiber and other good nutrition. And then we want half of our meal to be veggies um, or fr fruits and veggies are gonna be half of our plate. So really working to include some of those with all of our meals and we made it to the end. So um, any questions, I will take them now. Thank you, Melanie. That was really interesting. And people are typing um, questions in the chat. I'm trying to keep up here. What EGFR <laughs> should you be starting to talk to a nutritionist? I would say as soon as you are diagnosed, um, it is never too early to, to talk with the dietitian. Um, we can start working on prevention, start getting to know your dietitian. Um, it, is, it is never too early. What plant proteins are best if you have cysts on liver as well as kidneys? I heard soy can be problematic for the liver. Yeah, um, I would say any, honestly, any plant protein is probably going to be fine. Um, I wouldn't be worried about soy from food for the liver. Um, soy supplements, maybe, but like if you're eating actual sources of soy, like tofu or edamame or something like that, I wouldn't be worried. Um, but if, if you would like to avoid them, then maybe doing more beans, nuts, seeds, and lentils could be a good option. What approach should a PKD patient with diabetes have to limit carbs take regarding protein? Since yeah. meal planning to lower protein includes suggestions around carbs, veg, but diabetic mm -hmm. has to limit. 
Yeah. Um, so generally, if you have diabetes, we don't want to go at, we don't want to go like super low in protein, like that 0.4 grams that I mentioned sometimes. Um, generally for diabetes, we do want to be a little bit more liberal with the protein for that exact reason. Um, but we still don't want to eat a lot of protein. So really, really focusing on those non-starchy vegetables is like your bread and butter. <laughs> no bun and butter. Um, so um, really, it, it, there's not a huge difference. It just, you might really need to focus on those non-starchy veg vegetables more to fill you up um, and not going as low in the protein, but a, but a dietitian will be able, that knows you is going to be able to give you a whole lot more um, specifics. Any recommendations for those who lift or have hypertrophy goals? It's always a balancing act between getting in calories fitting your macros without exceeding protein restrictions, early CKD? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, I will say that that 0.8 grams of uh, protein per kilogram body weight is plenty of protein to help you build muscle. Um, I know that gyms and personal trainers may tell you something different, but, but that 0.8 is really, really plenty of protein to help unless you're truly like training for the Olympics. <laughs> um, that's it's, it's plenty. Um, and, and then you just need to go to carbs and fat to help get the rest of your calories. Um, carbs are not bad. Um, fat is not bad. We just want to make sure that they're coming from healthy sources to make sure that you are getting enough calories to fuel your body. The research seems to suggest a keto diet is beneficial for PKD patients. What is your take on that? Yeah, very good question. Um, I think there's a lot of really, really interesting research going on with, with keto right now and PKD. Um, I am very hesitant to recommend it because there are not any studies in humans or very few studies in humans. Um, and because a keto diet is so different than what we know is good for your kidneys, um, I need to see more research before I make that recommendation. Um, but I would say definitely work with your dietitian to see if that's something that you want to kind of try or kind of um, kind of experiment with. But I, I would be cautious with it. What do you recommend when there is not a renal dietitian in the state? Yeah. Very good question. And unfortunately that happens a lot. Um, there is a wonderful um, two resources. So the National Kidney Foundation um, and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, if you go to eatright.org, you can um, now, they just updated their database. You can filter all the dietitians by their specialty. Um, so hopefully that will help you find one. Um, if not, there are some wonderful dietitians who do work online and who have courses um, or who might be able to work with you virtually. We're also used to doing things virtually now anyway. Um, so I might check out some of those things, those, those dietitians. Are there any other questions? You can type them in the chat. I think the chats, there's a lot of stuff in there. They're talking about... Um, be it like beyond meat. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Plant-based so, meat alternatives. Mm -hmm. So these, these meat alternatives are so, so popular. Um, and I, I think it's great that people are kind of being more health conscious. Um, I would be very cautious of incorporating those consistently just because most of them are so high in sodium. And a lot of times they have potassium or phosphorus additives as well. Um, so I think maybe if you're in a pinch and you're really trying to stick to the plant-based thing and, you know, maybe it's better than a normal Whopper, <laughs> maybe, um, but I don't love them for like something to, to work to incorporate consistently. I think trying to focus on, I'll use the word whole food plant proteins, like actual beans and nuts and seeds and lentils um, should be, should be the primary focus. What are your thoughts on Oxal I'm not going to pronounce this right. Oxalatus. Yeah. How do you say it? Oxalates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I know that there's also interesting research going on with oxalates as well. Um, I think I do not recommend um, everyone limit them. Um, and the reason for that is there are huge differences between people people's bodies and how they absorb oxalate. Um, 
you could ask your doctor, and we, we do do this at the University of Chicago um, for, for PKD patients, um, do a 24-hour urine test, and that will let you know if oxalate is high in your urine. Um, if it is high, then I think maybe it does make sense to maybe actually make sure that you're getting in enough calcium or maybe cutting out some of the very high oxalate foods, um, like basically just spinach, almonds, um, rhubarb and beets kind of tend to be the, 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 those are so, so high and navy beans are like so, so high above all the other ones. Um, in terms of oxalate, um, but I do not recommend that everyone, because most people, their oxalate is totally normal. Um, and so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to cut out these oxalate foods because most of the oxalate foods are very, very healthy foods that we know are, are good for you. So I think maybe for some people, um, if you had a history of kidney stones, then definitely getting a 24 hour urine test to see what's going on and how your body is dealing with oxalate. But, um, but I don't recommend that for everyone because I think um, it, it cuts out a lot of otherwise, unnecess couldn't unnecessarily cut out a lot of really healthy foods. Thank you, Melanie. We are at time. I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions.